All right. Sorry for the delay, and this would be interesting because the wiring is not working for the display, so I can't hook up my laptop. Good job, ITS. Um, I'll introduce myself first, even though one of the slides has my name in it. My name is Dan Goudreau. Some of you have probably seen my recordings on YouTube for CST8215. Um, so some of you know who I am, some of you don't. Um, just so you have a bit of background, for those that don't know who I am, I am a part-time prof. I work full-time in the industry. I'm what they call a full-stack developer. So I all the way from the database right to the front end. It's what I do for a living. How does Linux apply to what I do for a living? Guess what the web servers run on? Linux. How much Linux do I need to know how to set up for a web server? A fair amount. So. I do know what I'm doing. There's certain chunks in here that's always a little rough for me every term because it's not my primary domain. I'm the backup administrator, not the primary administrator at work. So that means, you know, when we get down to the user permissions part, that's where it always gets a little crunchy for me for one lecture. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, two, um, I'm not politically correct. I'm warning you now. What does the Navy and computer software developers, programmers, have in common? Their language. I may drop the odd bad word here and there. I'm sorry, I apologize now. I'm also known for being sarcastic and calling out stupidity in class. So if you act stupid, expect to be called out on it, publicly. If I say something that offends you, talk to me after class. I'll try not to say that, whatever it was, a second time. Just calling it the way it is. Um, other than that, that's pretty much what you need to know about me. Um, I'll be going over the class policies and stuff shortly. Now, let's see how well this goes, keeping two slideshow. Oh, yeah, this is great. I forgot, this one's kind of special. Oh, no. Really? All right. So, what you're going to learn term is about Linux, the operating system. You're going to learn the basic commands and basically its general structure. You're going to learn how to use virtual machines. Why is learning how to use virtual machines important? If you ever hear about running things on the cloud, which is also known as running stuff on other people's computers for you, uh, they're all virtual machines. So you're basically emulating running stuff on Amazon or Azure by running VMware on your machines. I do the same. You're going to learn how to use VI, the absolute best text editor on earth. You will cry while you learn its commands, and that's okay. But you can do stuff in VI that I've never seen in any other text editor. You're going to learn about shells, bash, and scripts. Those are, you know, the different shells you can operate your commands in. Bash is one of the shells. You're going to learn how to write Bash scripts. There are recommended texts, but they're not required. Why are they recommended but not required? They're out of date the second they hit the paper, especially when it comes to Linux and operating systems. Um, operating system concepts, ninth edition is a snore. Um, if you are able to acquire a copy without paying for it, borrowing it from a friend, yar, um, knock yourselves out. There's actually some decent topics in there to learn. It's just, they're really, you know, if you need something to help you put to sleep, I guarantee two pages in, you're gone. Uh, a practical guide to Ubuntu Linux 4th edition is so far out of date, is insane. Don't even bother. Google is your friend. Stack Overflow is also your friend. Uh, the Ubuntu forums are amazing if you don't know how to do something. And is it available on the digital resource portal? Theoretically, yes, but once you've downloaded it, you've now been charged. If you don't download it, you can ask for a refund, theoretically. But they can check if you downloaded it. So. All right, classroom etiquette. <laughs> These are the ones I went to the wrong room coming here now. 
We just had a bunch leave here to go to the other end. Don't feel bad. Classroom time is for class. Lab time is for labs. If you're doing stuff in class that is not related to the course, I have one or two things to say. One, don't. Two, sit in the back row if you insist on playing games. Why? It's freaking annoying. Both for the people sitting behind you, because they're visual distraction. It's annoying for me because when you're trying to get your APMs up really high, click, 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 and the, both hands are going. It's really distracting for me because I have really good hearing and, you know, a constant rhythm of mouse clicks is really annoying. Don't watch movies in class either. Why'd I put that one out? Because I, you know, it's happened to me in class where I've caught people watching movies in class. Like, if you don't want to be here, don't be here. Just don't be here, not here. Um, life happens. You know, if you need to take a cell phone call, go out the door. Don't have it in class. I don't care. Especially not on hands-free. This is coming from experience. That's why I say these things. Um, the other thing I request nicely is if you sit in the front row, as you can see, I've got a microphone on. And if you have a Samsung cell phone, please put it on airplane mode. There's something magical with Samsung phones within uh, about six feet of my receiver for my headset that when the Samsungs go off with a notification, it actually causes a, a click in my recording. I don't know why, but so far I've traced it down to Samsung's. Maybe other phones do it too, but I do ask that, you know, if you're going to sit here, put, you know, basically like this block right there. Put your cell phone on cell phone, uh, on airplane mode, please. The mine's on airplane mode too. I don't care. That's somebody else's slides. If you're going to eat, yeah, it's five o'clock. We're all hungry. Fine, just, if you're gonna need something, make it something that doesn't smell too much. Like, don't break out like tuna in the front row. Actually, you're gonna make me Ralph, but like, if you're gonna eat like nuts, chips, you know, even a sandwich is fine. Break out the big fat poutine with like Montreal smoked meat on it, that's not cool. Just if it smells, please don't bring it in. Okay, so this course has two hours of theory, an hour, hour of hybrid, two hour lab, plus homework time. And that second one is bullshit. Oh, look at that. Thanks, Adobe. Um, attendance is not mandatory. Like I said, I'm using somebody else's slides because all the profs are all using the same set of slides. And some people take attendance and some don't. I'll explain in a minute, actually, like right now, why I don't take attendance. Number one, I record my lectures, thus the headset, thus the microphone, and I gotta hope this is actually recording. Yes, it is. So, I usually get my lectures posted up within 24 hours. I post them on YouTube. Not some internal chinky server that doesn't work at the time. So that means a couple of things. One, you're able to catch up on course content even if you're not here. Two, if you're sick, don't make me sick. Don't make your peers sick. Take that shit and take it home. Don't do it to the rest of us. Unless you're one of those people that cannot function unless they go to school. And we're all over 18 in here, I'm pretty sure. We should be by now. You know, try to be an adult, an adult a little bit and don't make the rest of us sick. We're not, you know. If I get sick, I lose my voice. That means, you know, we have a very quiet lecture that day. There you go. Lab, I don't take attendance because first lab requires you to show it to me. The last two labs require a demonstration. Everything else in the middle is set up as a quiz. Do the lab. If you have problems, come to lab. I will help you. If you're able to get through it on your own, hot damn, you don't need to waste your time coming to school. I'm okay with that. Again, with the lecture, <coughs> life happens. We're in the winter term. What happens in winter? 
in Ottawa. It snows, freezing rains, slushes, snowmageddons every once in a while. Don't kill yourself trying to get to school either. The video will come up. The only disadvantage of not attending the lecture in person is you don't get to ask questions. So there is a perk to coming to lecture because then if you don't understand something, you can ask the question. That's, that's the story on that. Um, so the, the second one there, the, slide, the third point is covered. Uh, I just covered. Um, all right, here's evaluation. Midterms, 30%. The course lead has decided there's only one midterm. Congratulations, there's a test worth 30% of your grade in the middle of the term. I try to make it as fair as humanly possible. There's final exam, also worth 30% of your final grade. Your labs are 30% of your grade. Your hybrids, also known as online assignment, is 10% of your grade. If you add all that up, it should add up to 100%. In order to pass the course, students must pass the lab and theory separately. In other words, you must pass the two midterms, well, the midterm and the final exam, on its own, and you must pass the labs and the online assignment on its own. So if you do 100% on the midterm and the final exam, you don't do a single lab, guess what just happened to you? You may have 60% in the course, but you just failed. This course is very practical-minded. It expects you to do work. It comes as a shock. But, yeah. So how do you get help? Email me, for starters. Which it leads me to, do you have office hours? No. I work full time. Usually my day involves me getting to work at 6.30 in the morning, work till 3, 3.30, jump in my car, drive home, get changed, come to the school, do class. If it's a sensitive nature, I'll make we can make arrangements. Outside of that, come and see me in lab, I'm totally there. You can check with your academic advisor, your program coordinator, which I don't know who it is for C, you guys are in CP, right? Okay, I don't know who CP's coordinator is. If you were in CET, I could tell you, but oh well. Um, the most important thing though is, if you think you're falling behind, ask for help. Asking me a week before the end of the term if there's anything that you can do to pass the course and you haven't done anything yet, I'm probably going to look at you and laugh. Out of shock. Not because I think it's funny. Well, I think it's funny, but, you know, I try not to make it look like that. So just know that you need to ask for help. That's the important part. Okay, this does introducing a bright space. Yeah, we've done that. Um, okay. Over here. Do I have bright space open anywhere here? No, I do not. Oh, I do. All right. Just give you guys a quick once over where everything is. This, you know what the front page look like, looks like? You'll get announcements here from me. Congratulations. Every week I'll put up an announcement after, usually within a few hours of the lecture that tells you what is due, what you should be working on, a link to the video, um, any errata, in case I make I screw up during the lectures and I decide I need to admit that I screwed up, I'll put it all in there. There's a weekly announcement, basically that shows you everything you should be handling this week. I found that's the best way to make sure everybody stays on task, because that way nobody can say I never told you. Um, the course is broken down in weeks, as you can see. You got all, all the weeks down here, down to week 13. Uh, when there's recordings, you'll find it under the recording section. The hybrids under the hybrids. Under course doc, I have the, oh, last year's CSI. I will be updating that. 
to this year's CSI. Um, because, you know, I really should update it to this year. And under contact info is how you can get a hold of me. My email address is there. The places I'm going to be this term are also listed there. And I finally, for the th on the third try, corrected all the 24-hour clock times. I work in AM, PMs, not, you know, 2,300 hours. I sh really should, but I don't. So it took me like three tries to get them all right. It's just my brain just doesn't want to do it some days. Um, which leads me to my last statement about this is I don't care what lab you come to except for the first two weeks. After the first two weeks, people are going to get starting into the groove. Then you can start floating between labs. If Wednesday at 7 o'clock at night doesn't work for you, there's always Tuesday at 7 o'clock at night or Thursday f uh, 3 to 5 and 5.30 to 7.30. Um, you got your pick. So, you know, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, not for the first two weeks. After the first two weeks, you can show up to any lab you want. I don't take attendance. It's not locked by section. No, that is on the schedule right there. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're regularly scheduled for Wednesday, and for some unknown reason you can't make it that Wednesday and you need help, you can come to Tuesday or the Thursday. I don't care. That's why I actually post the full times on there so you guys know where to go and when. Yes? Yeah, friggin' Jesus, Dan. Give me a minute. There's the lack of political correctness. How many times is it going to take me to actually get this correctly? Thanks for calling me out again. Well, because I had we had one student call me out on, on that, that because I sent out that announcement. They went through the bright space and they said, "Yeah, your times are wrong." Oh, okay. I like I'm sitting at my son's birthday party and I'm like, "Let's fix that." He's 22 years old. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's not like I was at like a nine-year-old's birthday party ignoring him. I was ignoring the bratty 22-year-old. Okay. No, not this. This. Okay. Slide show from the beginning. All right, now we're going to get the meat and potatoes of the first lecture. Now that we've done the introductions and I've managed to screw up three times in the first 20 minutes, it's going to be a good day. Okay, this is me. I've already introduced myself. This we've done. Holy crap. These slides are all on Brightspace. So, you know, if you have a hard time reading the screen, you can download and look at it on your screen. Okay, what is Linux? Linux is a Unix-like operating system. It's currently the most prominent, I can't say it's one of the most, literally the most prominent example of free software and open source development. Um, pretty much all the underlying source code except for proprietary bits that some hardware manufacturers insist on keeping proprietary, pretty much everything else is open source. Um, it was designed by a guy called Linus Torvalds. He's about as politically correct as I am. Actually, I'm, I've been told he's even worse than I am. Uh, he was 21 years old when he decided to write this. And it started in the early 90s. He wasn't happy with the current OSs. So he decided, hey, I'm going to make my own. Back in the day where it was easy to actually do something like that. Um, he w it had to be PC compatible, 3D6 and 4D6 compatible. Now, those of you in here are all too young to remember this, except for maybe, it's not good. I'm looking across the room. If maybe six of us? Seven of us might be old enough to remember 386. Uh, that was the last time AMD was at prominence. <laughs> They're back now, but that's the last time they were at top of their game. Um, 
so it came out in the early 90s, and I actually tried the, the original version 1.0 of Linux, the Linux kernel, on my uh, crappy laptop I had back then after I discovered it wiped out my entire machine because I didn't know, have any idea what I was doing. It took four days to download on my college's ISDN collection at 256k per second. It was 22 floppies. It's been around. Now, when we talk about floppies compared to, oh, I'm going to download an ISO. All right. Linux has taken the PC and Internet world by storm. Internet world much more than the PC. Um, because it has an amazing amount of power built into it. And every year, you release more and more features that lets it do more and more. One of these days, Linux on the desktop will happen. Probably once Microsoft does it. Uh, those that are using Macs, congratulations, you're using Unix. It's BSD, essentially. Mac took BSD, ripped off BSD and put on a shiny coat of paint and they called it Mac OS and pretended it was theirs. Which is fine, but it's still pretty much the same under the hood. So most of the commands you'll learn for Linux will more or less work on your Mac, if there are any Macs in this room. Any Macs left? <laughs> I love it. Oh, there's one. <laughs> right in the back corner there. I don't have a problem with Macs. I'm known for roasting Mac users, but there's nothing wrong with the Macs themselves. I just don't like their ecosystem. Now, as of today, Linux has taken step a little bit, but he's still putting his two cents worth when anybody asks, what we should we do next with the Linux kernel? And he actively calls people out for being stupid and thinking stupid ideas. Um, so he deals with the kernel and only the kernel. All the other subsystems are being developed by other people. Um, other companies combine all these different tools together and release operating system distributions, Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, CentOS. There's a couple hundred Linux distributions out there because everybody thinks they can do it better than the other guy and they all kind of suck in their own different ways. Ubuntu is Ubuntu and it does what Ubuntu does and you know Fedora and Red Hat does what Red Hat and Fedora does. They just don't like each other. So you learn one and you stick with it. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the slide for anybody who wants to know more about Linux. <coughs> so, originally it was designed for i386 computers, i486 computers. It runs on pretty much everything. If you have an Android smartphone, congratulations, you're running Linux. Um, runs on alphas, those chips are now dead and gone. They were amazing chips when they existed. Uh, for those of us that are old enough, probably might remember a company called Digital Equipment. They were a big, big IT company in the Ottawa Valley, based originally in Massachusetts, but at one point they had almost 10,000 employees in the Ottawa Valley. I worked for them when I first came to Ottawa. Mac and Power Mac, so you can install Linux on your Mac and actually make it not be a Mac. It's just, you know, I'm Linux with a Mac logo. Uh, Spark and lots and lots more processors. Um, it runs on pretty much everything. It's on millions of home PCs. No, it's not. Well, it probably is. So actually, if you do the math, it probably is. Office workstations, definitely. Uh, web servers, they're 90% Linux. The rest of them are running real Unix. All right, well, the Penguin's the mascot. It's known as Tux. Uh, it's been around forever. So it started with version 0 0.01, released in 1991, and version 1.0 came out in 1994, so that just dated me. When I said I installed version 1 on my laptop. Um, they're using a GNU public license, so it's known as GPL. Um, basically, it means the source code is available to everyone. You can download it, you can commit your changes to it, you can contribute back to the kernel. Good luck getting them accepted. But, you know, you can contribute back to the project if you really want. Um, oh, crud. This is wrong. Latest kernel version is for kernel 5. 
ish. Uh, I actually didn't take that slide, but not the one I had on Brightspace. They released the latest kernel release came out December 31st. So there it is. Linux is packed for different uses in Linux distributions which contain somewhat modified kernels along with a variety of different software packages. So that means that if you download Ubuntu, you get Ubuntu skin on Linux. It gets the flavor of Ubuntu. In other words, it comes with certain packages and it comes with a somewhat Mac-like UI. The buttons are on the wrong side in the wrong order as a Windows user, you know. Uh, there's a weird strip down the side that's like the Mac dock. Um, it has a fair amount of configuration that's all graphical. It's actually fairly easy to use. Um, and it's fairly compatible. Other ones, like I mentioned in the past, there's uh, Fedora, which is based on the old Red Hat. Way back in the day, Red Hat was one of the big boys. They still are. They got bought by IBM. Um, so now the distributions have taken a wide from variety, a wide variety of forms. So full featured desktops, Ubuntu, Fedora, um, and then there's server versions such as Ubuntu Server, which doesn't even have a graphical UI at all. It launches to a text prompt. We're talking old school green screen radiation inducing displays, um, and that's fine. You know, depending on what you need to do. If it's on a web server, you don't need a graphical UI. You don't want to have all that stuff running on top of the fact that it's supposed to be serving up web pages in a hurry. Um, so, and then there's minimal environments which you can fit on a, like on a CD, not a DVD, on a CD. Uh, for those of you that don't know what those are, it's like a DVD, but it holds less, a lot less. Now, i got to talk to certain generations in here, right? I mean, last term I said CD at one point, and I had a 17-year-old in the class go, huh? <sighs> I go, what, you not buy music? Right, nobody buys music anymore. So anyways, CDs. And it's a minimal environment. You can actually use it as recovery. Uh, there's uh, the Linux recovery project. That's one uh, good for fixing your Windows computer <laughs> when it goes wrong. Um, most Linux distributions are freely downloadable. Uh, as I've mentioned before, Fedora is one. OpenSussy is another one. OpenSussy was one of the big ones in the server niche years ago. And then they got bought by Novell. And for those of you that don't know what th that is, congratulations. You've managed to miss a dark spot in the history of computing. Um, there's Debian, which is basically Ubuntu without the nice skin on it, because Ubuntu is actually a Debian with a nice skin on it. Uh, Slackware, if you want to suffer. Arch Linux, if you think you're cool, while you're living in your mother's basement growing your neck beard. Uh, with Arch, everything is built from source. So you download the middle installer and it starts building your OS for you. About five days later, you have a computer you can use. But it's optimized. Okay. To install a Linux, you have to choose a distribution. Congratulations, pick one. I picked one for you guys this term. It's Ubuntu. Congratulations. It comes with an installation pack program, which basically, you know, you click install, and you follow the prompts, and magically you have an installed Linux. Um, for a while, well, Linux was easier to install than Windows. Windows 10 is now easier to install than Linux. You know, they take deciding which one's harder to install. There's so many distributions, it's insane. Um, some of them are only about eye candy. Uh, Enlightenment is one. And there's uh, oh, Elemental OS is another one. Elemental OS is really pretty. It's like using a Mac. Um, all distributions pretty much use the same stuff under the hood. Uses the same display drivers. It uses the same graphical processing side of the deal. The only thing that's really different is the skin and the basic. Some of the basic utilities it includes. Um, some have more compatibility with, you know, 
day-to-day -day Windows users, and others are more geared for development. Um, for example, another version of Linux that's becoming quite popular is called Pop OS. If you want to play Steam games on your Linux machine, that's your ticket, because it ha comes with the Steam installer built in. Double click on the icon, and away you go, you're playing Age of Wonders 3. I'm trying to do, uh, oh, shoot. But, oh, come on. The two screens in sync. The main differences between distributions are the optimization of the kernel. For example, some distributions target desktop performance as an end user. That means it wants to be responsive for loading programs, clicking on icons, copy-paste, moving files around. Other ones are optimized for pure I.O. For example, um, anybody here have a router that's not provided by their um, internet provider? S a few people. It's getting rare now, but you know, back in the day, you could actually, you know, flash your router with some other firmware, so it actually was useful. They're running Linux, but they, they're designed for high I.O. throughput. In other words, network port to network port without any delays. It doesn't care about the disk. There's a Linux distribution, I don't remember what it's called, designed specifically for video editing. It's designed for fantastic memory optimization and disk I.O. So it uses lots of RAM to cache disk I.O. Because if anybody in here has ever done video editing of any size, you don't exactly what I mean when, you're, when I start talking about loading up, uh, um, not even Premiere is not too bad, but you know, you load up a heavy duty piece of video editing software and your whole machine just wants to cry. Because the vi raw video files can be, you know, a gigabyte file is a small video. A terabyte file is normal for 4K video. It also determines what packages are installed or and or included by default. So some will include Office Suites, some will not. Some will include a web browser. Some will include Chrome. Notice I didn't call that a web browser. It's a stress test tool. Um, the interface for installing different packages, because there are a few different package families out there for how software gets installed onto the machine. Windows users are used to clicking on the EXC or the MSI and magically things just happen. Uh, Mac users, they're just used to taking the file and drag and dropping it into their app folder and poof, it's installed. Uh, that's got to be the easiest installer I've ever seen. Uh, with Linux, there's different flavors of it. With the Ubuntu derived ones, they use something called apt with Debian packages. That are Red Hat derived use RPMs which stood for Red Hat Package Manager. But, you know, and they all do slightly different things. They all behave slightly differently. Um, again, there's also administration tools on how to manage the software packages and includes a few other things too. However, here's one of the things. It's multi-user. So that means that you can have more than one person using the same instance of Linux at the same time logged into the same machine. No, you're not doing that like that scene out of uh, NCIS where two people are typing on the same keyboard. If you haven't seen that, go feel free to go look that up how stupid that was. Let me help you and there are two people typing on the same keyboard. This means that you each have your own instance of the OS launching, connected, and basically you're, you're sharing the resources at that point between multiple users. Um, normally, that tends to be more back in the days of the dumb terminals. So for those of us that are old enough, remember the green screens or the amber screens? When you go to, actually there's still some places like that, where you go into the store and they pull this terminal up and they're typing into a text interface. Um, more than one pe person can log in at the same time. But it, you can actually run multiple uh, graphical UIs at the same time too, which is cool. It's multi-process, multitasking. Um, there once was a time before Windows 7, we'll say, where Windows still had problems multitasking. Nowadays, it's gotten a lot better. It's significantly better behaved than it used to be. 
however, Unix-like operating systems are the kings of running multiple pieces of software at the same time. You get a many, many people logged in running many different pieces of software and they all kind of cooperate happily with each other. Um, and it is preemptive multitasking at the operating system level. In other words, the kernel itself, the very lowest layer of the operating system, manages the multitasking. It's not a layer above that. Like, like Windows, actually, the multitasking happens a layer or two above the kernel. So it's much more low level. So that means it, it exploits the hardware a lot better to give you better performance for sharing multiple tasks. And it's multiprocessor. Um, so now we people often talk about, oh, my computer's got six cores, 12 threads, eight cores, 12 threads. Every once in a while, you'll get that freak that's got a, an SMP machine. Multiple processors on one motherboard with, you know, multiple cores on each. That means you need special kinds of RAM and all kinds of stuff. Linux handles that stuff right out of the box natively. It doesn't care. It says, hey, dude, you got two 12-core processors. Good job. I know what to do with this. It, you don't even need to configure it. Windows, you need a special version of Windows to make that happen. And uh, now they made it even more special. You need Windows Workstation to make that happen. Multiprocessor is usually found at the high end of the deal. Normally, it's going to be in a workstation that starts at about 4000 bucks and up. Servers starting at about 3000 bucks and up. Um, but honestly, our multi-core machines are more than adequate to handle this. Okay. Oh, I missed one. Okay. What are the pieces that make up Linux? The kernel. I've been talking about the kernel a few. I've mentioned the kernel a few times. The kernel is the very first thing that launches. After the boot manager kicks in, and you know, I'm saying words here that probably you guys have never heard of. The boot manager is basically when your computer goes to boot, it asks the hard drive. Is, do you have information on how for me to boot? Hard drive says yes or no. You're hoping it says yes. Yes, I do. Go look here. And then basically the, OA, the computer says, oh, here's the file I need. It reads that first file, kickstarts the whole process. That file launches the kernel, and at that point, the rest of, the, the rest of it happens in order. Um, you can think of the, how many people in here have cars? Do you know what the ECU is in your car? Also known as the computer. You know, there's like a little box in the front of your car. If it dies, your car doesn't even turn on. And if it, the serial number doesn't match the other little box, your car doesn't turn on. The kernel is like the ECU. The ECU controls everything about your car. It controls, you know, how fast the timing happens in the ignition of the spark plugs. It determines how what the shift ratios are on your transmission. It determines whether or not your headlights turn on automatically. It even determines whether or not your doors lock automatically when you start rolling. That's the kernel of your car. It's in that ECU. Linux and Windows, because Windows has a kernel in there too, is that very first piece of software that launches that allows the OS to talk to the hardware and the hardware to talk back to the OS. So it's the translator. The kernel also has modules. The modules is basically drivers. So in Windows, how many people in here have built a gaming PC? Or built a PC in general? You've had the experience of, let's go get the driver. Either you're stuck in a CD or you downloaded it off the internet, or if you're lucky, Windows figured out what you needed right off the bat. In Linux, they're not called drivers, they're called modules. It detects the modules are there, it loads them. There's a priority for each module, it determines what order they load in. And the modules are either loadable individually or they're compiled right into the kernel. Which means if it's built into the kernel, it doesn't need to load the module, congratulations, it loads faster. However, your kernel gets fat just like if you eat too much pizza. 
You stuff too much pizza in your gut, eventually your gut goes, looks like mine. You, a fat kernel is a slow kernel. So you tend to want to have as little in there as humanly possible. No, 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 no. Fat as in fat ass. Not fat as in file allocation table. Yeah, that's that's a file. That's just file system. I'm talking about a a fat kernel is a big kernel that has a lots of stuff in it, and Ubuntu's kernel is the desktop kernel is fat, as in it loads a lot of stuff as part of itself. It's built into it. The kernel is quite large. It occupies a lot of memory. It's not as efficient as a kernel that has less stuff in it that loads modules as it needs them. The next one is daemons. Not demons, daemons. Daemons are background processes. So in other words, the OS boots, after the kernel has established itself and it now knows how to talk to the hardware, it starts launching off all the daemons in the background. These include uh, scheduled jobs, launching a web server, uh, launching your favorite database server, which is Postgres. Insert other thing here. Um, there's tons of daemons that run in the background. In Windows, they're known as services. So if you've ever had to go look at your services in Windows because something's not working, like Postgres didn't launch today, you go to services and you hit start. There you go. Normally I start at boot up, they run in the, ba the background on demand, they're on all the time. And then there's applications. Applications is a weird misnomer here because most people think of application, they think of, you know, Open Office or Word or Photoshop. Applications in Linux land could be, again, Open Office, Firefox, or a command line tool. Every, basically anything you can type in as a command that runs as a program is treated as an application. Most Graphical versions of uh, Linux have an application manager. Some repetitive slides in here. Um, they're designed to help with installing and moving your prepackaged applications. There's a few in, few different styles of packages listed there. Um, it also manages um, the GUI. Now Linux runs on some uses a GUI called X Windows. They've been trying to replace X Windows for 15 years. They haven't replaced it yet. Because it does what it does and it does it really well. What it doesn't do is perform well. X Windows dates back to the 70s. Just so you know how far back it goes. It is a detached graphical interface. When you see the GUI on your screen, it's actually, your screen's actually talking through the network to get it. So that means I can actually connect, for example, I could connect to a server at work and launch a graphical tool that runs on the server over there, but it displays on my desktop. It's not VNC'd in, it's not remote desktop, it's literally running the GUI portions of that application on my machine, but the rest of it runs on the server. So the, it's a detached, interface. One of the biggest things they've been doing for years is trying to make the whole thing seamless so that it doesn't feel like it's running remotely. Back when I started with Linux, you logged in using a command prompt. You dropped to a, basically what looked like a DOS prompt and you go start X. And then you'd have a GUI come up and there was like nothing there. And then you'd Control, uh, control Alt F1, go back to your command prompt, and then you type in, oh heck, what was it back then? Mosaic. Enter. Control Alt F7, oh, there's this mosaic's now showing up on my desktop. It was special. Um, things are way easier now. It's literally people can use Ubuntu and just go for it. Um, tools, utilities, and add ons. Tools and utilities are things like uh, VI, more, less, cat, tac. These are all command line tools. 
you'll learn all about was this term. Okay, why would you choose Linux over another OS? There's usually no licensing requirements. In other words, you install it, you're done. You own your OS. Own. Um, there's usually no subscription fees for the software itself, unless, except for a very small niche subset of tools. And these are usually engineering pieces of software or medical imaging software. And that stuff, you know, the software costs ten, fifteen thousand dollars per seat, so you could call that an ongoing fee. Uh, other examples that have an ongoing fee: Oracle. You install it. You just gave up your left kidney and your firstborn, and you got the installer. Um, that kind of stuff happens in Linux land too. That's just ongoing costs. One of the biggest support points, though, for Linux is the fact that there's a huge support community behind it. Odds are, if you've got a problem, somebody else has had it. And they probably know how to fix it and probably post it somewhere on the internet on how to fix it. If, you, if your rear Google foo is good, you're probably going to find your, if another functional machine get to the internet. Um, the documentation project is great. There's, oh man, that feels old saying this one, an IRC chat room. IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat. Used to be the way we text each other. Um, obviously websites, Usenet, news groups. Those are actually still exist in Linux land. And last I heard, there's still a Gopher server. That's way old. Um, and there are usually Linux user groups in your area. Ottawa has three. So if you go look up for the Ottawa lugs, you'll find other people that can probably help you. So, you know, they usually have an open question night. Then, you know, people meet up and they show up with their computers and they geek out together. And it supports pretty much all the hardware. And this is really funny when I see this slide because I've, I've been using this slide for a few years and I always laugh whenever I see this. Because everything after this means absolutely nothing to anybody under the age of 35. <laughs> USB, people know what that is. You're used to fighting with getting the plug in. PCI, that's for the people that put their computers together, right? You're plugging in your PCI Express cards. AGP, Advanced Graphics Port. That's when you wanted a screaming one megabyte video card plugged into your computer. It was literally just for graphics. Uh, PCMCIA, people with laptops used to have this little slot and you could plug a card in there to give yourself expansion because laptops really sucked and they had like no functionality. So you had PCMCIA cards for network, for wireless, for smart card readers, for insert things here, serial ports, all kinds of things. Uh, SCSI, SCSI, um, that used to be how you ex connected expensive hard drives to a computer, amongst other things. All right. Linux coexists well with other operating systems. Um, it's getting a little harder with modern PCs ever since UEFI came to be and Microsoft requires secured UEFI to boot. If your computer shipped with secured UEFI enabled, you're going to have a rough time getting Linux on there just to protect yourself from yourself. Um, but you can still fairly easily dual boot, so you can actually boot Windows, boot Linux, whichever flavor of the day you want to use. Uh, you can have them side by side. They just exist side by side on the hard drive. They occupy their own space. You just lose disk space. Linux can read other file systems. It can read pretty much every file system from Microsoft. So. File system from Windows 9X, which actually really should be saying it can read the files system back from the DOS ages. 
right up to the modern file system NTFS. Um, there's actually other modules you can install to read other file systems. I've recovered files off one of our people's Macs using Linux after I took their hard drive out of their Mac and you know plugged it in a cradle and I used my Linux machine at work to save their files because their OS was dead. It actually booted with the bong of death one day. It's a great sound. It's usually followed by screaming. Um, and it's gone to the point where you can actually run Windows software, old Windows software <laughs> on Linux. Uh, they're working on modern compatibility also. Um, there's a piece of software called Lindos, Wine, uh, or you can just use VMware, like do the reverse of what you're, we're going to be doing in this class, which is running Windows and or Mac and with VMware and then run an operating system in that, you could actually flip it and run Linux and have a VM to get those pieces of Windows software you really must have. Um, Microsoft is actually working hand in hand with the open source community nowadays. That was a shock to everybody when that happened a couple of years ago. Uh, they released uh, the .NET Core, which is basically the underpinnings of most pieces of software written for Windows in the modern day. Those libraries have now been ported to Linux and Mac, which means you can actually build software that runs on all three platforms. Microsoft is embracing everybody now before extinguishing. But they, hey, they, I can't complain. As long as they make it easier to work with, I'm happy. All right, Linux has superior networking abilities. That is the truth. There's all kinds of nifty things you can do in Linux that you can't do in Windows, uh, including filtering, determining which, if you want to hit an IP address, you can tell it to go out a different network, ad uh, network adapter. Um, if you have plugged Wi-Fi and LAN plugged into a machine, you could actually direct packets down two different networks if you want. You can say, well, you know, if I'm going to go and browse the internet, I'm going to go through Wi-Fi. If I want to go use VPN, surf parts of the internet that your mother would make your mother cry, it's going to go through this connection instead. So you can separate your traffic if you want. Uh, you can do traffic shaping. You can say, well, this kind of traffic is more important than that kind of traffic, so we give priority to this over that. Um, it was literally designed for networking right from the start. Um, to give you an idea how it was designed for networking from the start, when I first graduated from college, because I'm a college graduate, in 96, it's a few years ago, I had a job offer to go work at the hospital in North Bay. This is, and they were actually using Linux to inter-network the two campuses. That was like Linux 1.1. And they were still able to use it to inter-network two different hospital campuses. So just gives you an idea how much the networking was like built, bolted in right from the start. It's good for recovering old machines. So you got that old machine sitting at home that's gathering dust because it's not good enough to run the latest games. Whatever. Or you need to give your grandmother a computer and you don't want to spend any money. You can buy an old computer, pick up an old computer, install Linux on it, and it'll actually behave just fine. Old hardware, it doesn't care. You just pick a distribution that is light, a non-fat version. When you install Linux, and we're going to go through some of this later, um, you normally need to create two different partitions. So Computer Essentials, did you guys, they cover partitions to you guys in Computer Essentials? Okay. I once had a group say no. So that made this slide a little harder. When you install Linux, it needs two partitions. It needs a root partition, known as slash, forward slash, to be precise, not backslash, and a swap partition. Uh, the swap partition is optional. It's used for virtual memory. Um, Windows has something called a swap file. When it runs out of RAM, 
it uses a chunk of your hard drive as RAM, then it's known as swapping, and your whole computer just goes no, unless you've got really fast drives. Even then, it goes no. Uh, with Linux, same deal. There's a swap partition. It's usually double the size of the amount of RAM you have in your machine. If you've got 16 gigs of RAM, your swap partition is usually 32 gigs, 64 gigs, something of that size. And it basically gives your computer a little extra RAM so that if there's a program that it's not using, it takes it out of your fast RAM, puts it on the disk. Then when it needs it again, it asks the disk for it back and puts it back in RAM. So that's what swap does. It lies, essentially. Um, there's other partitions you can create, slash boot. Used to be a really common one. You'd have a separate partition just for the boot files. Remember earlier when I talked about how the computer asks the hard drive, can I boot? Yes. Where do I boot from? And then the hard drive tells it you can go look here. And that tells it where to get his boot files from. Guess what's in slash boot? The boot files. Um, a lot of people like keeping that one separate from, from the main partition because if you boot your main partition, at least you can still boot. And maybe recover your main partition. If it's part of the main partition, well, too bad. Uh, slash user is where you install your program. Slash home is your home folder. For Windows users, that's the equivalent of your C backslash users folder. Home is the same as user. Um, the file system type of most Linux distributions they use, now they're on ext4. Um, there was a version 2 and a version 3. Version 2 is terrible. Uh, if you have a power outage and your computer turned off, odds are you lost files that day. It was a bad time. ext3 brought in journaling and ext4 brought performance. Uh, ext, it's backwards compatible, but not forwards compatible. So, an ext4 file system can be treated as an ext2 file system, but you can't you can't go the other way around. Okay, root is uh, one of the terms in. Linux that and Unix that confuse people a little bit because root can mean either the root of the file system, yeah, for you guys to be that way, file forward slash, right? But the super user is also known as root. The user is called root. And when you log in as root, you have permissions to do everything. There is nothing you can't do except open up encrypted files that are encrypted with somebody else's password. You can crawl through a user's home directories with impunity. You can change systems. You can log users out. You can add new users and kill their programs while they're using them. It's fun. Root is God as far as the Linux operating system is concerned. Don't delete your root user. You're not going to have a good time. That's unrecoverable, just saying. The root user has a home directory of its own dedicated to itself. It's called slash root, more root. So root's home folder is called root, and it's on the root of the file system. So if you're thinking root, it's always root. And when you log in as root, you can now add another user using something called user add. You can change other people's passwords using passwd. It's fun. You can change somebody's password without asking them permission. Really, you finished the pizza, eh? No logging in for you. You're going to learn all about these commands. The Linux GUI is convenient to use, but many people, mostly administrators, still prefer using the command line to do most administrative tasks. Why? Because most of the GUI only exposes about a quarter of what the settings are. They show you what you need, but not necessarily what you'd like. For example, in Windows, you open up Control Panel. There's a series of options there, right, that you can tweak. Did you know most of those settings can be tweaked in the registry? 
way more accurately. That most of the things you have, you can actually turn off using the registry without ever opening up a command prompt. I mean, a, a configuration window. Um, it's kind of cool. Linux is the same way. It gives you a GUI with the basic functionality. And if that doesn't do the job, you drop the command line and you modify text files. Because all the settings are all in text files. Character-based terminals. You guys learned what a DOS prompt was or a PowerShell prompt last term? Yes, this is going to be your term. All term. All the way. It's command prompt all the way. It's like using DOS all over again. Open commands and stuff happens. Um, the command line tools are usually faster and more powerful and complete than the GUI counterparts. Um, to give you guys an example, I was working with a text file. I was trying to work on Windows. It was a really big text file, like 560 megs. And I was trying to put in, I was trying to convert it into a file I could import into a database. And I was using something called Notepad++, which is top tier text editor on Windows. And I started a search and replace function, a piece of functionality, and I sat there and I waited for an hour watching it eating a RAM. My machine's got 32 gigs of RAM. It was using 17 gigs by the time I killed it. Windows actually started swapping. I haven't seen that machine since I got it. It's the first time I'd seen that. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Um, I loaded the file in VI on a Linux instance. Mm, two minutes, 36 seconds to do the same job. It still ate six gigs of RAM, but six gigs versus 17 gigs. The command line tools are way faster. They use up less resources because there's no GUI between you and the tool. And when you launch a your command line in Ubuntu, as you will, um, in the dashboard, you can type in the word term. It'll bring up the terminal. You can also go Control-Alt-T for the keyboard-centric people. It'll bring up your terminal, same thing. Or you can go Control-Alt-F1 and just pretend the GUI doesn't exist, which is pretty much how I live my life. Um, there's a few important commands to shutting things down. In the GUI, you can go System Shutdown. So there's a neck on the corner. It's just a mic on, shut down. Or you can command line prompt it, and the command's called shutdown. And it has arguments. Dash R means reboot. Dash H means halt. Once was a time when you shut off a computer, it used to tell you, it is now safe to turn off your computer. Anybody remember that Windows 95? Maybe Windows 98? Linux used to be the same. It would go to the point where it would go shutdown, dash H, and it would have a problem on the screen saying, Safe to power off. This is legacy from back when these kinds of operating systems were actually meant just for servers. You didn't want your server to just randomly turn off because it might cause other kinds of problems, so it would halt it. It would put a halt message on the screen saying, I'm now done playing. Feel free to turn me off. And when you give the argument now, it means it does it now. Or you can say, in 10 minutes from now, you can shut down, which is cool. A shell. We're actually almost done, folks, I think. What is a shell? A shell is a command interpreter that executes commands. Now, in Windows, we have two, three. We have the command prompt, which is DOS. And we now have PowerShell, which is DOS on steroids. Linux has tons of them. Because as with everything else, any operating system that has over 100 distributions will have lots and lots of different shells for it. The most common one is called Bash. And it's the born-again shell. B-O-R-B-O-U-R-N-E. 
like Jason Bourne, not born again. But so one you guys are going to be using is bash. That's what you're going to use in this term. Uh, it has a command interpreter built in. It has a built, usually most command interpreters shells have their own utilities built in. Bash has a series of built-in commands of its own. Um, most shells have their own programming languages built in. So Bash allows you to write scripts in Bash. You're going to hate it. I'm telling you now. The last two labs, you're going to hate it. It's sort of about spaces, carriage returns, stuff like that. Um, there's other shells that actually provide other languages. For example, there's one called C shell. Like, you know, like a C shell. Somebody got clever when they named it. What language do you think it uses? It uses a C-like language. So Java people tend to be more happy in C shell than they are in Bash. But there's so many scripts written for Bash that nobody uses C shell. There's one called ZSH. And there's one called uh, Rx shell, which uses a language called Rex. Uh, Rex was the program language behind the, uh, it was the program language for uh, OS2. It's getting old. There's all kinds of shells. Shells can be interactive or not. Interactive mode means you can type things in. Non-interactive means it reads a script file, which I guess you guys must have learned in your computer essentials known as a batch file. Picture a batch file that's actually useful, that actually does more than one thing. Um, I've got a couple of batch, uh, bash files, not batch files, batch files that run on my local servers at our Ottawa office that in mirror our Amazon instances once a week. So it grabs, it dumps the databases from Amazon and loads it up on one of our servers here so that, you know, if ever the asteroid hits North Carolina, we don't lose all our data. You know, it's important. That data is gone. We don't have a company anymore because <laughs> everything is on Amazon now. Um, so non-interactive, you run the command, stuff happens, and then you're hands-on again when it's done doing what it's doing. Ah, there's the bash. Slide for bash. Born again shell, because originally it was called born shell, BSH, and then when they decided to improve it, they decided to make it born again. Somebody actually had a sense of humor. Kind of. Um, it can be run on most Unix-like operating systems. For example, those with Macs, you launch a command prompt, it's running bash, or some version of bash that's Mac-specific, but it's running bash. Pretty much bash has been ported from Linux to back to pretty much every other <laughs> operating system that it was based on. So anybody who had BSH before, they now have Bash, because Bash is, you know, that much better than the original BSH. Um, it was originally released in 1989. Notice we said that Linux got released in the early 90s. Bash was released in 1989, which means it was actually originally released for Unix. And then it was ported to Linux, improved and ported back. Um, it was written in C. Yes, C, not C++, real C. The one that separates the men from the boys and the women from the girls and whatever else applies. It was originally written by Brian Fox and it was always GPL'd from the beginning. So it's always been open source. Um, there's a few commands that you can use. Um, the problem is I'd actually run those commands. Guess what's not on this machine that I'm currently using to display here? Yes, there's no VMware. This machine can't even run VMware. So if you type in a command called cat etc shells, it tells you all the shells that are available inside the OS to you. Uh, cat stands for catalog. 
Uh, if you want to know what your current shell is, there's the command for that. Um, shells have something called built-ins. A built-in is a shell that's built into the shell. So you'll never find that command anywhere on the operating system because it's built into the shell. Um, when you execute a built-in command, it doesn't launch a new process. So it's not like when you launch, for example, on Windows, you launch Chrome because you want to make your computer suffer. Chrome launches many processes, right? It launches, then it starts eating resources and launching processes because it feels it can. When you run a built-in, it doesn't launch a new process. It keeps itself contained inside itself. Uh, an example of a built-in is the help command. So bash has a help command that tells you what the other built-ins are. Help, and it tells you what else it can do. Okay. I am not going through this one. Just bookmark this, because I guarantee if my past experiences run true, 15% of this group will need to know this slide. When you do your, for lab one and you install Linux, we tell you to keep track of your password. Make it something you're gonna remember. Otherwise, you're gonna come to me and say, I can't get into my machine anymore, and then Dan's going to do this. It'd be great if you could actually do it yourself. So this leads me to a, a short aside. Computer security is only as good as physical access to the computer. You're like, my computer's got like passwords and biometric identification. If I can get at the keyboard and reboot the machine, you're done. Uh, it takes, last time I did this, it was 14 seconds to change the root password. And I, could, I got access to the whole hard drive at that point. Windows takes me about 49 seconds to do the same thing. It lets me log in as local admin. Done. Your files are all mine. Unless you're encrypting your, hard, your partitions. That's a different problem. So... Make your, your your password rememberable because it makes no difference. <laughs> <laughs> passwords online are important. Passwords for your local machine, not so much. And this actually does the screenshots on how to do it. Um, so some basic commands that are good to know. Passwd lets you change your password. Who am I lets you know who you are. Now, if that always seems like a funny command for people that haven't seen it, you'll learn this in a few weeks when you start playing with users. Uh, you don't always know who you are. If once you start jumping and pretend uh, and you start taking over other users' accounts, after a while you actually lose track of who you might be. As long as you have to ask it who you are. Because you can be root, become a user, that user can become root, and then that, that root can become a different user, and after a while you don't know who you are anymore. You start having split personalities. Um, host name. What's the name of the computer I'm currently running on? That's kind of useful to know. Uh, Uname tells you what version of Linux you're on, what flavor of Linux you're running. Tells you what kernel and often distribution. SU lets you switch users. SU, switch user. Um, PWD lists your, lists your current working directory. So if who am I tells you who you are, PWD tells you where you are. If I PWD'd myself right now, T119, Building T, Algonquin College, Woodruff, Ottawa, the whole background. Uh, creating a directory is called MKDIR. I mean, if you did DOS in your computer essentials class, this is not going to be a mystery. The command is different. It basically behaves the same. LS, same thing as DIR on DOS or command or PowerShell. LS lets you see what's inside the folder. And what's really cool now is in PowerShell, it recognizes LS. So for those of us that switch between operating systems, I don't have to reprogram my brain anymore. It's great. I can work in Linux, work in Windows. Commands are the same. 
CD says DOS. And PowerShell CD slash root, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to root, change directory. Um, there's a few strange behaviors, though, that is not typical for people that are used to running in Windows land. If you type in the words the just CD enter, it brings you to your current logged in user's home directory. If you're a root, it brings you to root. If you're logged in as Dan G, it brings you to slash home slash Dan G. Tilde also brings you home. So you go with CD tilde. And for those of you that don't know what tilde is, look above your tab key to the left. Under the escape key. Next to the one. I can't get more precise than that. That's the tilde. It's shift back tick. And it's the same thing as saying go home. So you can either go CD, CD slash whatever your root folder, your home folder is, or CD tilde. They'll all do the same thing. RMDIR removes the directory. Surprise. It does exactly what it says. Um, you can do dash p, which lets you basically genocide the entire family if they're empty. So if they're all empty on the inside, you can just say goodbye with one command. More. If you have a really big file or you have a very large set of output, man, I wish I could run these commands to show you guys. Um, more allows you paging the output. So you do ls-al slash etc. So after you guys install your Linuxes, you can try these commands out on your own. Let's just say if you do an ls-al slash etc, it's going to display pages and pa screens and screens and screens worth of text. More shows you one screen full at a time. Then you can hit the space bar to skip through the rest of the page. You can use slash to tell it to search. I think if I remember, P lets you jump to the previous page. Let's do maneuver. <coughs> now, if you're trying to find how to run certain commands and what the arguments are, there's something called the man pages. And man pages stands for manual pages. Most Linux and Unix operating systems have a built-in manual. Most people don't know this. You open up the command prop, prompt, you say man ls, it shows you all the options for ls. Um, you can go man a, and it shows you all the man pages for that command, because some commands actually have more than one man page. So it'll just show you all of them one after another. There's also another command called info, because having a manual is not enough. These also have info documents, which is basically the manual in a slightly more user-friendly version. It's slightly more bridge. It gets rid of the more cryptic crap. And most people, after they've done man and then they do info, the next thing they do is DuckDuckGo or Google or insert favorite web search engine here because... You're going to type in what you want, and then somebody's going to actually t give you an example nicely typed up on how to do it on a web page. Okay, this is the important one. This is one of the more important slides on here. Absolute path versus relative path. A lot of people have a hard time understanding this. The absolute path is the path that starts from root. For Windows users, it's everything from C colon backslash. So you know when you load launch. C colon backslash. That's root. And if I browse through, this should be interesting on a computer that's controlled. See up here? The full path is listed, which this isn't going to get recorded because I'm not doing it on my computer. Doing it on the screen, but that's fine. What's highlighted up there is an absolute path. It's the path right from root. It all in Linux, it always starts with slash. So the very first character of any path, you give it if it starts with slash, it's an absolute path. It traces the complete path from the root directory to where you currently are. The whole path is listed. 
makes no difference where you are, so you can refer to a file somewhere else on the operating system. If you give it the root, it always knows where to go. If you use tilde, it, that's the absolute path of the user's home directory. So if you use tilde, it's always the absolute path to the user. So it'll be slash home slash dan g, for example. A relative path is where is the path based on where I am now? Is it up one, down one from where I am? It's relative to your current position. So for example, if I was going to use an absolute path to Dan, we'd go T119, Building T, Algonquin College, whatever the heck it is on Woodruff Avenue, Ottawa, Ontario, Postal Code, Canada, North America, Earth. Northern Hemisphere, Earth, right? Absolute path. A relative path is, I'm in T119, that's in building T. And I'm currently standing at the front of the class. So that's my relative path. I don't, I'm not referring to the rest of the world. I'm just identifying myself where I am right now. And if I want to say, oh, I'm going to go now tell somebody in this, you know, go tell you to go move. You, I want you to move relative to me. In other words, move one layer away from me would be stepping out the door and no further. Or I could tell you, no, you know, get closer, get further based on relative path. An absolute path is absolute. A relative path is based on wherever you happen to be at that point in time. So, when using a relative path name, you always need to know where you are. An absolute path, you don't need to know where you are. I almost think the absolute path has GPS coordinates. You know exactly where you are. A relative path is I'm standing on the corner of Woodruff and Baseline. Which corner? I don't know. That one. But you need to know, uh, be able to tell someone where you are, you end up having to give them more information because you have to know exactly where you are when you're using relative paths. So if you need to know where you are, PWD tells you where you are. Um, there's two special characters when you deal with relative paths. These are the same as in DOS. There's dot and dot dot. Dot means here. Dot dot means one up from me. One closer to the root. Using the make directory command here, make dir test means it'll make it where I am now. Make dir home user one test is an absolute path, so I could be sitting in user two, but it will still create it in user one because I'm telling it the full path on how to get there. And there's some more information about that stuff. You should really memorize some of this. But you're, there's a lab on relative paths, so you'll get to get comfortable with it too. And, you know, there's more on that. I explained it fairly well already. Okay. Now, to wrap things up, hot damn, I'm right on schedule. Now, we have a lab right after this class for those of you that are supposed to be joining me in P something or other, 213B or something, I think, or 312B. I got to go double check. <laughs> I'm not sure where I'm going. Um, so they're going to be the first ones getting a kick of the can installing Linux. Congratulations. Um, that having been said, I do try to keep my lectures short, just so you know. Like this is actually a fairly long lecture. There's going to be a couple of other beefy ones, and then they get light through the rest of the term. I'm also going to try to do as much content before the midterm break, <coughs> the reading week, sorry. Um, because your midterm is the week before the midterm, before the spring, br uh, spring break or reading week. Um, so the next couple of weeks we'll have a fair amount of content, and then it's going to thin out a little bit after that. Other than that, uh, it's been fun. I'm going to go open a ticket to see if we can actually get something here that actually works for next class, because it's going to be really hard for me to do my demos otherwise. And I will see you guys uh, in lab.